Hi, I'm Matt Sargent with ABC Acres out here in Hamilton, Montana. I'm in our newer high tunnel, the Artemis High Tunnel, named after uh, the Greek or possibly Roman uh, goddess of the wilderness, hunt, uh, childbirth, fertility, all things good on earth. Um, and we're out here to talk about uh, the second part of our series on soils and healthy soil. Uh, last week I showed you how to collect a soil sample and send it in. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to interpret that. I'm going to go in a direction that a lot of permaculturists um, might frown upon. So hopefully this doesn't offend you. Hopefully you gain some good information out of it. I think it's really useful and it's uh, going to be a good way of looking at your garden ecosystem. Um, the first thing you're going to notice in any um, analysis of a soil test um, and what most people focus on is the percent organic matter and that is good um, it's a great thing to focus on we know if we have good organic rich soil that it's uh, capable of hosting a wider array of bacterial and fungal life and the greater diversity we have in our soil um, of life the better we're going to have nutrient exchanges so Generally, um, you can add a little bit of percentage matter increases a year. Um, and with good compost, you can add a lot. And if you're turning it in, you can end up with pretty good. It is possible, however, to have too high. So you're shooting for something around a 7 to 8% organic matter. Um, and you should be able to hold all the moisture you want and have a good array of um, soil biodiversity. The other thing about your organic matter is it's where you hold nitrogen. Most soil tests can't test for available nitrogen. It's too volatile. By the time the lab gets it, you're not going to know. So if you don't have a high level of percentage of soil organic matter, um, you're going to be concerned about nitrogen sources. And nitrogen is necessary. Um, it really fuels the leafy growth of plants. So um, if you have low organic matter, you're going to be wanting to think about using some sort of nitrogen fertilizers. And when it comes to amendments, I'm always a fan of uh, local organic um, fertilizers. Don't be using synthetic stuff. Um, you're just, you know, mining petroleum at that point. They leach out, it's a waste of your money um, and not a best use of our world's resources. Um, but the next thing you'll look at beyond your or percent organic matter is your phosphorus. And there's generally two types of uh, phosphorus analysis, sometimes three. The first one is the P1 or the weak bray. And that's the amount of phosphorus that is available immediately for any crops in your garden system. Um, the second one, P2 or your strong bray, is also kind of tied to the available, but it's more of a reserve phosphorus. Um, but it is there, it's not necessarily as bioavailable. And then the third type of uh, phosphorus exchange um, is more dealing with alkaline soils and the amount of available phosphorus. And phosphorus is a key macronutrient for plants. You need phosphorus available. However, it is possible to have too much. And so this is why I really recommend you test your soils before you just start putting stuff down because you saw in whoever's video that they were you know, using rock phosphate, for example, which is a great source of phosphorus if you don't have it. But if you have too much phosphorus, that stuff doesn't leach out. And too much phosphorus can limit your plant's availability to take up calcium. And uh, then you're going to have these just plants that don't look very healthy or vibrant. And it's really hard to um, get rid of excess phosphorus. Speaking of excess phosphorus, um, one thing that I forgot to mention when I was encouraging people to get soil tests um, is if you've done your soil tests and you're adding compost and you, your soil has not been tested with that added compost, also have your compost in analyzed because compost, it can be a great source of phosphorus. And I actually know growers who have applied too much compost. Um, that sounds like it's not possible, but it is. And they end up with really high phosphorus levels, which goes back to what I was just talking about, about how an excess of phosphorus can really stunt your plants by limiting the amount of other micronutrients they can take up. And having too much phosphorus, um, essentially it creates an unhealthy soil microbiome 
so you don't have the full array of um, beneficial good guys working in your soil, make, allowing the calcium um, to be uptaken by the plants. The next macro element that a soil test is going to look at is potassium. This would be K in the NPK. If you ever look at a bag of fertilizer or amendments, it'll have NPK, nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, and this is a fairly straightforward thing, depending on the crops growing and the type of soil that you're working with in your neck of the woods, so to speak, you're looking for an ideal range of anywhere from 150 to 250. Uh, 250 is definitely starting to push it. Below 150, your plants aren't gonna have what they need. So you're gonna be looking for sources of potassium. All right, and the next factors that you're gonna see, or I generally look for, um, are kind of tied hand in hand and one of them ties kind of back and forth with all of them. So I'm gonna start with that, and that's your soil pH. Um, most of the time, for most annual crops, you're gonna be looking for an ideal soil pH of 6.5 to seven. That's where plants are happiest, and that's what makes worm castings freaking awesome, because what comes out of the end of the worm is perfectly pH neutral right at seven. So if you can encourage worms, that's one of the best reasons to do it. Um, they also help with your tilth and all sorts of other stuff and having a good worm population generally says that you have a pretty good soil micro microbiology but the other reason they're beneficial test to another key part of your soil test is every time they leave that little worm casting behind them they inject just a little bit of lime um, which is uh, indicative of your calcium levels and so a lot of people focus on the calcium and magnesium levels in their soil. Um, it's still up for debate in real scholarly circles as to whether or not the amount of magnesium in your soil does bind up the amounts of, or of available calcium. But generally speaking, if you have a good healthy pH, you're going to have enough calcium. If you have a crop that's really heavy, heavily dependent on calcium, it can be good to have sources of calcium for that plant. Um, prime example would be tomatoes. Uh, you know, my grandma used to always put a couple of tums in every uh, hole when she planted her tomatoes. Personally, I'm not into that. I don't think anyone should be eating tums, so I don't want to grow my plant in tums. But uh, when I plant my tomatoes, I crush up an eggshell and put that in each planting site for the tomatoes um, because the calcium will really help benefit or prevent um, blossom end rot which is generally um, caused by a lack of calcium. That said, if you just put calcium into a non-biologically active soil, if you just put like an eggshell in there, it's not gonna do anything. Nothing's gonna transform that into a plant available form. But just know that typically speaking, if you have good pH, your calcium levels are gonna be fine. And I've never really found in my experience magnesium to really throw everything off and it is a necessary element um, but if you're dealing with your magnesium calcium imbalance um, generally speaking you're going to be looking for more natural forms of calcium instead of just straight up lime that you would buy at the um, grocery store you're going to be looking for something more like eggshells or the calcium that you would find in bone meal, which is a good source of calcium in addition to um, your phosphorus. That said, if you already have the phosphorus, you don't want to jack up your phosphorus levels by applying bone meal just to get calcium, if that makes any sense. And so all of those things, you know, those, those cover your basic macronutrients and gets into some of your micronutrients. Um, if you want to get really geeked out, like I said, you can get the Kinsey Ag Report um, have them do an analysis of your soil and they're going to list all sorts of other micronutrients. But for the purpose of this video, I'm not going to get into all those and good sources of them. But what I want people to start thinking about and acknowledging um, is there's this closed loop myth. Um, and people are shooting for a closed loop farm or a closed loop garden where they're not having to have amendments in their soils. Well, when you look at ecosystems um, beyond the farm or beyond the garden, oftentimes those ecosystems collide and interact, and that's how nutrients are cycled. Um, if you look at you know the uh, old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest, 
they are heavily influenced by the fact that grizzly bears catch salmon, eat them, and then deposit the carcasses at the base of trees. And that's a good source of uh, sea phosphorus for the trees. And the trees are really dependent upon that cycle. They're dependent on animals cycling the nutrients. So when you're looking at specifically a garden setting or in the high tunnel where there's not a lot of uh, natural interactions or they're very limited, um, we are the animals. So we need to be bringing those minerals and macronutrients to the garden, to the soils, so the plants can grow. Um, if you're looking at a food forest or a silvo pasture or even your pasture, I, I don't lean as heavily on amendments. Hopefully if you can have a good balanced system, your animals are doing a lot of that work for you or the wildlife in the food forest is helping cycle nutrients. However, when you're talking about agriculture where you're either consuming the produce or selling the produce, even in permaculture, um, you're losing nutrients with every time you eat or you sell that stuff. Those are nutrients, um, micro and macro, that are leaving the farm or the garden. So unless, um, you know, on a small scale, if you're homesteading and you've got a composting toilet and after three years you're using your humanure in the garden, then you might get close to that closed loop. But, you know, if you're doing any sort of farmer's market sales, um, CSA, um, just sharing the abundance of your garden with your friends and family, if you're not adding back to that system, you've removed a key part of the garden ecosystem, the animal interaction that's going to help cycle those nutrients. Um, that's kind of the down and dirty of what to do with your soil analysis and thinking about how to replace the nutrients that you are taking out of and managing the chemical portion of your healthy soil. Tune in next week where we're going to talk about managing the biological side um, to have to fully utilize the chemistry that we focused on today. Um, so yeah, any questions or comments, we love to hear from you. As always, thanks for tuning in. And until next time, happy growing.